What's going on, gang? We actually did it. Uh, new, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Those who've been following my journey, massively appreciate your help. Massively appreciate you actually being part of what, what we went through. And also, I hope I gave you a good fly on the wall experience in relation to what an Ironman actually is. Sit back, relax, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to be going over what actually happened throughout the race, what actually uh, I would learn from, what I, I'll take away, things that you shouldn't be doing, things that you should consider, and also the sort of lessons that I learned from a leadership and trust standpoint. So the last previous two videos, obviously you guys would have seen our preparation for the Ironman, would have seen actually what happened throughout the Ironman, where layman's terms, I actually got an exercise-induced pulmonary edema, which basically means one of my lungs filled with fluid and started to collapse. And I finished the, I actually finished the Ironman with that, ended up in ICU for five days. Literally at the time of this recording, I've just had the green light to exercise again, which is fucking awesome because I, yeah, I, was, I had the fear that something bad had happened. Reversing back, right back to the start, layman's terms, I felt good. I trained 11 months for this race and I've done, so done a lot of challenges in between. We obviously did last year, we did a 24 hours, 24 hour race up Mount Snowden, where we went back to back and did 75k each between me and Mr. Brad Foster, who I ran the Ironman with. Also, I had done a marathon, I'd also done a Fred Witten challenge, I'd also done the Chase the Sun challenge, I'd also simulated a half Ironman, whilst in between all that, training nearly full time. So I, I felt that I was capable, I felt like I was confident, and I was going into the Ironman with the understanding that I wanted to prove a point to myself that I could do it, and I could give myself adjustable time for me. So I wanted to go sub 12 hours. Now, going into the actual race, personally, I felt calm, I felt relaxed, and I felt, I felt collected. We've done, we've done all the work. I've done everything possible that I felt that I could with the situations that are in. And actually getting into the swim at Copenhagen, if anybody hasn't been there before, it's actually a very flat course, but also the actual swim itself is a very still water, which is perfect for someone like me, who swims like a barge, not like a yacht. Um, and as the gun went off and got us, got us uh, moving forward, actually Copenhagen is quite a nice one because it sets you off in waves of people. You're not, you're some Ironmen, you've got 200 people crawling all over you. This was set off, I think it was in sets of six or sets of five, forgive me. Anyway, long story short, it's also straight. So I had the opportunity to, to swim 3.8K. I swam the fastest I've ever swam. Uh, I've never covered that distance at that speed before. Project when I first started swimming, my projected time was just under two hours. Going into this race, my projected time was about one hour 40 if I, if I was to do it off my, first, my half Ironman simulation. But actually, I came in at one hour 25, just under. So I'd already smashed something and I, I don't feel like I pushed myself to the limit. I didn't, I didn't go absolute hell for leather. What I actually focused on was I literally focused on each stroke, my technique for each stroke and lo and behold, it actually worked and paid off. Transition, the transition was really good. Uh, shout out to Mark, Mark Foster. So we ran with Brad, Mark uh, and Craig. Uh, Brad's dad, Mark is an extremely good swimmer and he's a very good on the bike. He's obviously older than me, so we called him the Rolls Royce. He uh, came out the water just before me. And I saw him, uh, so I thought I've actually come out at a good time here. Transition is a very strange one. The main thing that I did, again, anybody who's doing an Ironman is, is slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Don't be erratic. Try and get your breath back and try and focus. That's what I did. I took, took my time to get my gear off just because I think some people rush it and they like, rip their wetsuit or they fall over or there's a lot of people, so just be mindful. Got onto the bike um, and I felt really, really good. I, I had a gel, again, get people a little gearing into these races. I was trying to cover minimum between 30 and 45 grams of carbs per half an hour. But when you're doing an Ironman, what happens is, is especially in Copenhagen, is they give you personal needs bags. Personal needs bags are for you to have on the course. So I, I'd halved my, my bike nutrition, not knowing that the actual Ironman competition they provide you with, I knew they did, but I've never done one before. So when we were cycling, um, the first personal needs stop was actually nine, nearly 90k in off the top of my head. Got half of, as we we're attacking halfway around, I started pushing the needle a bit. Uh, obviously, adrenaline, and I wanted to win, and I wanted to win for myself, not win for anybody else. Just I felt like I wanted to make sure I got in underneath that six hour mark. About just before 90k, I started being sick um, due to many different reasons. I think one of them was ingesting. Um, carbohydrate maybe a bit too quickly I wasn't sure one thing that I did that probably was a bit wrong was I I had litre bottles on my bike and I put uh 90 grams of carbs in those litre bottles because when they said on the stations that you'd be able to get water I wasn't sure whether you're getting water in actually refillable bottles or they were just giving you plastic bottles so I thought in my head was I'd finish half and then I'd top it up and dilute it again so I'd continually have sodium and a carbohydrate mix it didn't work that way they were handing out actual plastic bottles and me instead of me sticking to the game plan I decided to launch my, drink my bottles, launch them, 
and reload with theirs. So I changed my carb mix um, and I changed, I, I think I got water on board from swimming and I started vomiting. Um, wasn't sure why. I thought that I was vomiting because I was just pushing really hard and my heart rate wasn't, wasn't bad. Another thing that actually went wrong was something for you to remember is check your batteries on your cadence sensor and your bike, your bike computer, your heart rate monitor. My bike computer didn't work. Um, I could only see time, it, would, it wouldn't register any cadence or speed. So I just was going off how fast I was covering the ground and using my Garmin, I was, I was tracking how far I was. And it, Garmin, your watch is accurate, but not as accurate as a bike computer, yeah? So I started being sick. Now in that position of being sick, I'm sick on the move. I wasn't being sick, I wasn't stopping and going into a bush. I was vomiting on myself. I was basically vomiting over the bike or onto the floor. In that period, I think I ingested stomach acid, which is obviously, which is obviously vomit. Uh, inhaled it. I had COVID two weeks before the race, which again was not advantageous and I thought that I was over it. But what actually happened was obviously because my lungs weren't ready for any foreign invader at all, whether it was a disease, a pathogen, or obviously vomit, it started to secrete mucus to try and liberate or get rid of, of the fluid that were on my lungs. I didn't know this at the time. I, I just thought I was being sick. So I pushed through. And what I actually did was, instead of me looking after my... Um, Instead of me getting my carbohydrate sources from my special needs bag, and, and actually, which in, in hindsight, I did actually stop halfway through for literally two minutes to reload. I didn't actually, I forgot, the, the sodium that I had in my bag had fallen out. So double-edged sword, I wasn't using my carbohydrate mix in the end. I wasn't getting sodium on board and I was starting to be sick. Now, that, that, that sort of trilogy of, of events was my downturn of my, my, my race. I... Came in off the bike at five hours 44. The fastest bike I've ever been, by, by far the fastest bike I've ever done. And obviously I was super pumped. I was extremely happy and, and, and proud and pleased. I got off the bike and I've never been so stiff in my life. Like my hips, all the way from my shoulder to my hip, to my knee were stuck together. It was like I was a piece of board and I was so tight. I can't tell you how tight it was because I literally, did, I got off the bike for two minutes for my special, uh, personal needs bag. And I was still wretched. I wasn't sure why. I, I just thought my, the, the, in, my, in the back of my head is, Will, you're just being, you're wretched because you're pushing your body to a limit it's never been to before. I've never done that far swim. I've never done that far run, uh, that bike back to back. And obviously in an Ironman, what I'm doing then is I'm going into uh, a marathon. So I just said to myself, I just got to keep going. I'm taking on gels. I'm trying to take on sodium at this point. But again, as I mentioned, I'm starting to vomit uh, every would have been every 10 minutes. I mean, I'm fully retching really deeply and my throat was so sore. Um, so first 10K, first 10K, anyone who knows Copenhagen, it's a four loop track. It's pretty flat to be fair. Sun's out, amazing vibe, amazing. Like anyone who's done an Ironman, you'll know running around the course is so nice because everyone's cheering you on and the, the amount of support's amazing. First 10K I hear in 56 minutes, uh, I felt great. I felt like I've got this. I'm gonna get underneath this 12 hour. If I can keep this pace, I'm going to be okay. Second 10K was when it started to happen. I started feeling fatigued. I started, started little thoughts in my head, like, mate, what are you doing? And I knew this would come because of ultra endurance. You, you massively play games within your head. You massively feel the race going away from you or you, when you're in the race, it's actually that, that bit that's trying to tell you to stop. So I massively started leaning in and pushing and talking to myself. Physically, I was physically talking to myself telling me to carry on, keep pushing forward, keep attacking, keep working. I, keep, I use these words as, as cognitive cues to shake off that little demon on the back of your head that's trying to make you stop. At 20K, my body started telling me no. Um, I started to slow down and I knew I was slowing down. So I was like, okay, cool. Let's, let, let's, let's pull back a bit here. I'm going to run between each aid station. I'm going to walk the aid station. I'm going to take on water. I'm going to try and take on some food, try and calm down. It's salt and electrolytes, obviously, you're trying to get them on the course, but they're not as, they're not as, it's not as easy. There's obviously one place for you to get pers your, your um, personal needs bag. And I had salt tabs on me, but as I said, I just couldn't, I couldn't stop being sick. Um, and that was it. It was like the plug was pulled out of me. For at 16K to go, um, I just couldn't run anymore. And I, I, I was so angry. If you look back on the video, you'll see at the start, I just can't stop being sick. Every time I ran for every five minutes, I'd start hurling. And what's going through my head at that point is obviously I'm so annoyed that it's come down to this where I feel like my body's given up on me. I'm very, very lucky that I've got years of training and years of physical trauma from rugby, from getting kicked by a horse to doing physical feats that aren't that most people aren't supposed to be able to do in the times that I've done them. 
I was lucky that I could lean on my previous experiences. And I think that's where you look at sort of self-belief and self-determination theory and things about, I was, I was, there was not a chance that I was not going to make it. I was going to get over that line whether I liked it or not, whether my body liked it or not. Um, and as I said, at 16K, I started to walk. 14K out was just, my world was, my world was ended. Now it wasn't like ending in the relation to like, um, I felt like I was, I was putting myself in a, in a locker I was so angry that, I, that it had come down to this. And, and Craig, luckily, Craig tapped me on the ass to, to pass me and I, I wanted to chase him and trip him up. <laughs> but I couldn't, it couldn't even run. Uh, Mark passed me, was telling me about, about how he was dealing with it because everyone's starting to get cramped from gels and stuff. And I didn't understand why. I just could not stop vomiting and I couldn't breathe. My, I was chest breathing and I was really hyperventilating, which I was breathing was very short. And I was like, right, I've just got to walk it. I'd realized that my body was giving up. I realized that I wasn't in a place to, to, to complete in the time that I wanted. I realized that it was getting away from me. And it was, it turned from wanting to beat myself and beat my time to not losing. I was un unwilling to quit. I would refuse to do that. And, and at the time during the race, I, I, I was saying to myself, I'm willing to go to the edge here. Like I, I'm, I'm fucking not going, and there, when there's no turning back. I'm not, unless they pull me off because I've, I've collapsed, it's not happening. I remember walking along and, 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 and Rach coming to see me and asking me and I just couldn't breathe and I kept, I was talking to myself in third person basically saying, why has this happened? You just got to keep going. Come on, keep moving, keep moving. And I was, I was using that and I was in a whole other place. And I don't think anybody understood how the severity of my symptoms were. Um, I was going blue, which I, at the time I didn't realize it was pitch black, so I didn't know. Uh, and actually my hands were starting to swell up with water, which meant my kidneys weren't working properly. Layman's terms, what had happened is because I'd got so much fluid on my lungs, my heart was working so hard. I wasn't getting any oxygen around my body, uh, which was then obviously causing lo lots of strain. And obviously I wasn't taking on sodium. So my kidneys started, to, I was so dehydrated, my kidneys started to not function properly. Layman's terms, the marathon took me seven hours, um, which it was projected to take me before. So it took me seven hours. I, um, I remember ringing the bell and I was desperate to do it because obviously that's what you do at an Ironman. You want to hear those famous four words, Will Foden, you're an Ironman. I ran through, I can't even remember hearing him say it. Uh, and I was just shaking. Uh, if you guys go on the video, you'll see me swaying. And at first I'm there swaying around thinking, Will, are you doing this for social media? Not, which I clearly wasn't. I was trying desperately hard to walk and I couldn't. My wife, is, Rachel, was shouting at the, um, at the, at the medics. Um, and also before that, shout out to Brad who came back for me and walked to me for the last 4K. Um, I was very proud to have run alongside him and he wasn't gonna leave a man behind, which he's been an OG of the Stage John Collective forever. And he knows that that's a massive, massive uh, trait of what we do is a team effort. And I massively appreciate him and everybody else that helped me that day. Got into the, uh, to the tent and they'd measured my oxygen saturation in my hands. Now my oxygen saturation was at 62%, which anybody who is living, walking around right now, it should be at 95 plus. I shouldn't have had the opportunity, had the ability to, to be still standing properly. I should have been sat down with a mask on, but I can basically, layman's terms, completed half a marathon on one lung um, because one of my, my other, my left lung was like a water, like a water balloon that was full of, had been full of water. It was all stuck together. They obviously panicked, went straight into an ambulance, straight to ICU, straight in. I just remember lying there, no t-shirt on and a pair of, in, in basically in half of my, um, my tri suit and Rachel was sat next to me and the doctor, this lovely lady, she was English. She literally came in and she literally said, Rach, just to be clear, there's 15 doctors going to come in here because your husband is in serious trouble. I had a very much a sense of calm. I just completed the hardest thing. One of the hardest races I've ever done in my life. It had not gone the way that I wanted, but I also knew that I was in the safest place possible for them to take care of me. So I had uh, lung scans. They weren't quite sure what had happened to start with. I had my heart scanned and they basically told me that my vitals were running at 50% and I was on the brink of a heart attack if I wasn't careful. Um, I think when someone says that to you and someone someone obviously threatens, that says you're threatening, you've threatened your life, you don't take it on board. Especially when you've been in the position that I've been in where I, I was so adamant that I was gonna finish. And this is one of those things where I'm extremely proud and, and, and honored to have been able to finish and complete. But I didn't want this to, I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed that it got to this. But it's something that I think the biggest lesson that I learned about myself, well, shout out to Simon Ferry and May, who I think guys, you guys read my Instagram, you'll know, that gets to a point where you know that everything's gone wrong. The wheels have fallen off the bus and you don't know what the fuck to do. And the only reason you have to finish is to prove a point that you've still got something in the locker and you're building trust with yourself. 
with somebody who's a leader, somebody I'm entrepreneurial. I want to, I'm always, I'm a professional. I used to be a professional athlete. I take that professionalism throughout my whole life. I wanted to prove that, that I was unwilling to quit. I wanted to prove that I was unwilling to give in. I wanted to prove that I had it in the locker, even when I was under the most amount of duress possible. Don't get it twisted just for my mum's sake. If they told me in the course that I was on pre-heart attack, I probably would have stopped. But if I was being super honest, I definitely wouldn't have because I it's, it's in my DNA. And that's a bit barbaric, I agree. But it's how I'm wired. And I want to, I want to, if obviously, if it was definitely life-threatening, I definitely would have, but I didn't know. So I don't know is the answer to that. I think I'm saying this is live on telly, live on YouTube, sorry, about, about I, I'm very proud of what I did. Anyway, long story short, I was on uh, gas for three days. I had blood work and my inflammatory markers were massive, obviously. I lost eight kilos. Um, but after three days, everything went back to normal. And I started, when I was basically for three days, I was vomiting blood out of my lungs and mucus. And you see, yeah. I think it was the first time I've ever actually just, about, since I've done my knee where I sat back and just put my hands in the end, gone cool, I, there's been a big mistake here. And Obviously, from a responsibility standpoint, my, my viewpoint changed. I was very much a case of, right, cool, Will, you've completed this, well done. But now, guys who don't know, well, me and my wife, my wife's pregnant. I didn't want to put that much stress on her. I don't, I'm not going to lie. And also my mum, I remember ringing my mum and I, I rang and I was like, my mum, it's okay. I'm okay. She literally basically put the phone down and got a flight over. Um, but after that, they let me go. They, at first, they were saying I wasn't going to be able to fly. I wasn't going to be able to travel. I was, I was all do doom and gloom. But actually what happened was I, I, I came out, I was tired, I was always skinny as shit. But I actually done what I said I was going to do. Um, unfortunately, as I said, I had to stay a week in hospital, or five days. Came back home, excuse me, and it was like nothing had happened. My body was, was, was back to normal, I felt good. But what I did, I, I took note from the doctors. They told me to go see a cardiac specialist because obviously I put so much strain on my heart and my vitals. My lungs were back to 100% function. I had no long lasting damage. Um, and I, I've just literally, as of today, I went, I went to the um, cardio, a cardiac specialist here in Manchester, who is, he specializes in basically professional sport. And I got the green light. Everything's working fine. I'm just jaded and detrained. So all's well, ends well. Biggest life lessons that I want you guys, that people, people to know, especially we talked around people who are new to Ironman and want to be new to endurance. The number one golden rule is stick to the game plan. If I was being openly honest, I think my ego chased me down and I decided to, ch to swap speed for precision. That was my downfall. Secondly, big mistake, when I started being sick, I should have pulled back. I know that now, but I was starting to lean in. That was the biggest problem. And lastly, um, a big thing for you to think about is that an endurance race is not one on one feet of exercise, especially in an Ironman. It's about actually being efficient on all of them. I, I, if I took away what had me being sick, I would have absolutely smashed that. I was going in sub, sub 12 hours, but I didn't. And there's something that I have to live with. Now, there's some of the questions I've got. When's my next race? At first, I was going to tell you a long way away, but according to my cardiac specialist, I could actually start thinking about competing soon. So. I'm not, I'm sitting back. The Station Collective has got some massive things incoming in relation to personal days. We're teaming up with some amazing, some amazing groups of people. Um, and I would like to, to focus on that and obviously developing our team. Obviously, I've had a baby incoming. So that's going to be a, huge, a whole new journey for me. And I'll share with you how I'm going to deal with it from a physical, personal and professional standpoint. And lastly, just a massive thank you to everybody that's, that's been involved. And thank you to everybody that has actually helped me, wants to be part of this G'd me on, sent me kind messages when I was in hospital, sent me, sent me some um, messages on YouTube just saying how they really enjoyed the videos. I do this because I want to educate others. I do this because I want to be a coach of substance that gives people what they actually need to learn and they need to initiate and utilize, not just for the bells and whistles, not just for the influencer points, not just for likes and all that kind of shit. I value connection. And I feel that with, the, with this platform, my ambition is to actually bring education around all things high performance across the physical realm, the personal realm and self-mastery, as well as the professional realm, as you as a business owner, you as you operating in any form of team, you leading other people and you being a role model. So that was my, that was the diagnosis. That's what happened over the, the Ironman. Things that if you guys would like to learn more and you guys would actually like to know more, do me a favor, comment below. I'll be more than willing to answer any questions. It's one of those things I wanted to describe exactly what happened throughout the race, but I also wanted to give it an open-ended forum of if you are about to compete, if you are competing, if you want to be a better version of you, 
I'm gonna do my damn best to show you exactly what not to do, what happened with me, give you the science around it, and also give you some application that you can take away right now. So anyway, gang, thank you very much. Stay tuned. We've got an amazing YouTube episode next week when it comes down to we're gonna actually be a bit more focused in relation to what's happening with the Stay Strong and Perform program, and also a little snippet into an insight of who we're gonna be start working with, which we're starting to work with a fire service, helping fire service men and women actually elevate their performance. So there's some really cool stuff coming. I can't wait to share it with you. Anyway, gang, stay tuned, stay safe. Any questions, do let me know. And thank you very much.